So uh, please silence your cell phones so that uh, we aren't interrupted during the talk. So uh, Wes just arrived back at MU about five months ago, uh, and he is actually a colleague of mine in this building. So prior to that, he uh, did his undergraduate work at the University of Oklahoma, where he was sort of kind of thinking about being a veterinarian. Oklahoma State. Oh, sorry, Oklahoma State. That would be a census for Oklahoma State people. Okay, <laughs> Oklahoma State. The Oklahoma State? <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, and then he did his master's work at Clemson University, where he was starting to trend more towards the reproductive biology angle. And then he came here and got his PhD in the animal sciences department, which is where he's back at now, um, working on the uh, a gene that they thought was involved in fetal growth, and so this was getting him from the reproductive biology angle into genomes. And then he did an industry postdoc at Searle, and then was hired on at uh, basically Monsanto for 18 years. 10 years. Sorry, what? Ten, 10 years. 10 years, I thought you said 18. No, that's Wash U. That, oh, Wash U, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I clearly need to take better notes. Um, and then uh, only just recently he was recruited to come back here, and uh, it's already been really exciting having him around. He's uh, brought some really stimulating new ideas into the, the, the building and the life sciences community. And so let's welcome Wes and hear about uh, how our cats have us trained. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Yes? Awesome. So, so as she mentioned, I'm going to be discussing this mystery of cat domestication. Um, I apologize if some of you came to the, uh, the uh, brewery and saw some parts of this talk, so I've mixed it up a little bit, if you did. Uh, so you will get some new material. And I also echo what she's saying. Thanks for showing up when you have the, the True False Film Festival in town. I know that's a very popular event. Um, but I hope what, what I'm going to share with you today is going to be very interesting and fascinating especially if you are a cat owner. So let's get into the talk. So here's what I'm going to cover today. First, I'm going to give you a brief overview of domestication. So what does that mean? Uh, what, what, what is the history of that process? And then we're going to kind of look deeply at the cat story uh, and kind of review what's known about cat genetic history. And then I want to really uh, share with you some of the results that my lab, in collaboration with Les Bédéons here at the University of Missouri, uh, looking at the genome and how that may have been altered by selection, or natural selection or artificial. And then finally, I want to end up with where we're going with some of this information in terms of cat health. Uh, how are we going to use this genomic data or this variant data that we're collecting? So that will be the, the last part of the talk. So I like to start off all of my talks uh, with this slide here because it kind of gives you a, a broad overview of what I like to work on. And as you can see, I like to work on a lot of different things. All of these things are fascinating to me. So one of the strengths of our lab is basically we get DNA or we get contacted by collaborators that are interested in any one of these species. And they all have unique stories to tell. And when they, we, we generate the, uh, or we decode the genetic blueprints of life for each one of these species. Once we do that, we ask questions about how they're different from other closely related species, or we want to ask questions about population. So many of these, what I like to think of this process is, is comparative medicine. So we're always interested in what the genomes are telling us in terms of the phenotype to genotype connection and how that relates to human health. <clears throat> now, some of these projects take on different flavors. Uh, conservation biology, I would describe them as. One example of that is the bald eagle. Uh, in this particular project, we were trying to develop uh, uh, sequence markers so that we could understand the population structure. Then we feed that back to the fish and wildlife um, agencies, and then they can develop better models for trying to introduce new birds into different locations. The whole goal of kind of mixing up the genetics to make sure that diversity relates to our, our results in health. So all of these projects are fascinating to me. I mean, it's a great job to be able to decode, the, uh, look in the black box of these genomes and then ask all these 
fundamental question. So the story really has to start off with, with Charles Darwin. So scientists have been fascinating, fascinated about domestication process, how it happened, why we see these differences. So Charles Darwin published his findings about traveling all around the world and looking at the differences between wild and domesticated species in 1868. And this is the really first detailed description, and he cataloged all of these differences in this book, The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication. Now, at that time, Charles did not have all the molecular tools that we have today. So what you're going to see is kind of how we're looking at this question today in the cat. But this has been applied to many other species as well. And we'll see in a moment what that means. So Darwin described this process here. So as a multi-generational process of altering traits of wild animals or plants by controlling their reproduction. So in essence, uh, humans were looking at these animals, mostly on the food producing side, and using these particular uh, methods of trying to find animals that they could corral and, 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 reprodu and uh, control reproduction. So this was kind of the key to the first starts of domestication. And at the time, Darwin also cataloged all of these different um, traits that they were observing that were different between the wild and the domesticated species. And now we, we refer to this as dom domestication syndrome. And over here on your right, you see some of the, the features or the differences between wild and domesticated. And I show just one example here of, of rabbits that have been domesticated. And you can see the floppy ear versus the tall erect ear. Now, all of these traits don't, uh, don't show up in wild versus domestic. So there's some examples where dogs have pointed ears and have floppy ears. So that's one, one example I can cite. But of all of these traits, tameness is the key trait uh, that shows up in every single one of these domestication events. Now, whether you're looking at chickens, and you might not think of chickens as domesticated, but uh, they are tame in terms of what they look like versus a red jungle fowl ancestor. So this is really a, a key focus, and you'll see throughout the talk, I'm going to kind of hint on some of those, those changes that we're observing for tameness or docility. Now, if we look back at the history of domestication, uh, I've really only included a couple of examples here, but there are many, many examples of domestication. And, and the reason I include these, because I think these are most relevant to the story uh, for CAD, and also for comparative purposes, I think this is a fascinating way to look at the story. And as you can see here, uh, I've included the dog, sheep, cattle, and pigs. And you'll notice for at least the major food producing animals without chickens, uh, sheep, cattle, and pigs all around 9,000 years. So if you know something about the history of agricultural revolution, 9,000 years ago is when we kind of saw this birth of agriculture. And that was in this area called the Fertile Crescent. So it's an area of the Middle East near Israel. And so a lot of the, the grains and the domestication of the grains and, and animals in general happened around this time. Now, the other thing that will really jump out at you is this number here for the dog. So the dog is the oldest domesticated animal that we know of today. And, and, the, and the estimates vary around 30 to 40,000 years. So there are a lot of variation or a lot of debate in the community as to when that timing or, or when that started. But we all agree that the dog's the oldest domesticated uh, of these animals. And there's lots of genetic studies that have been done in cattle and pigs and sheep. Uh, and the dating in terms of what's going on is, is, again, varied across all these different studies. But these are the general agreed upon dates. If you want more information about uh, domestication, the, the Wikipedia site is actually very good. And it's got a lot of different examples and jumps into some of the details on the molecular side as well, if you're interested. So what is the story of the cat? So the cat, we really start out with trying to ask the question, there are different pathways to domestication. And what they refer to as prey directed and commensal. So prey, of course, would be a situation where there's a lot of rodents coming in to eat grains. And this draws the cats in. And as a result of interacting with humans, they become more familiar with them, become comfortable with humans, and they kind of domesticate themselves in that process. And directed is kind of an offshoot of that. Uh, but this would be more of a, 
humans wanting to feed them and keep them around, but not actually bringing them into their household. And then the last of these would be the commensal, where actually they bring them into the household and treat them more like a pet. Uh, so there's more social interaction with humans. Now, the difference of these are subtle, uh, except for the prey. Uh, then the question boils down to whether it's self-domesticated or directed, what, what I call directed, which would be human uh, artificial selection. If we look back now on the fossil evidence and ask the question, how long ago can we see actual fossil evidence where we have humans and cats buried together? And really, the earliest evidence of that is about 9,000 years ago. This fits well with our estimates of, of the agricultural revolutions. This also fits well knowing that if they're storing grain, for, uh, rodents are coming around eating those grains, humans would see this as a beneficial uh, situation for them to encourage these cats to stay around. It also could be just cats just come around because they want this prey, it's easy to get, and then they leave when they want to. So this is the question back and forth of self-domestication versus directed. There's also a lots of data in, in the Egyptian era around 4,000 years ago, and this is probably the most popular that the public's familiar with uh, in terms of cat domestication. Obviously, there's lots of art. There's tons of mummified cats. Um, there's these deity questions about the Egyptians actually put the cat heads on human bodies, and there's goddesses. The most famous goddess of fertility is a human with a cat head. So they obviously really uh, love their cat, and we know at that point in time for sure that domestication was And then recently, there was a paper with a colleague of mine, uh, Fiona at, at Wash U, published with the Chinese. And this uh, really shows clearly that uh, the fossil evidence here of these bones and actually the, the, the teeth and how they're worn down and what they're eating shows that these, these particular cats, this is about 5,000 years ago, were cohabitating or commensural in terms of the relationship with humans. Now, again, 5,000, 9,000, uh, I think we can all agree that it's at least around the timing of the agriculture evolution is when domestication was started. And I threw in this humorous cartoon because I want to kind of break it up of the seriousness of the science. Uh, this is really, again, contrasting dogs versus cats. So if you can't read in the back, it says, I actually love you and pay attention to your state of mind and your feelings. And the cat says, pet me, please. So. That's kind of, I think, if you're a cat owner, a lot of you think of cats this way, and cats may think of us, us as this way. It's, well, we just don't know. So back to the science. So if we start to try to understand the process of domestication and how it happened, there was the first study that came out in 2007 with my co colleague Carlos Driscoll uh, and Steve O'Brien. It tried to clarify uh, the different sub, the known subspecies at that time of, of wild cats. And over here on your right, you can see all these different subspecies. There are five subspecies. Now, if we take genetic markers that can distinguish these subspecies and look at this question and sample cats all over the, uh, the uh, geographical regions uh, of the uh, Asian and the African and European theaters, you can kind of see the color distribution here that we've modified from the paper. And at the bottom here, you see the Caffra, which is considered the, the African cat here. And then you see the Libica here in the, in the blue. And then this is Bieti over here on the far right, the purple. And it's very clear that uh, the, Bie or the Libica is really the source of the germplasm that's created the, the modern domestic cat, what we refer to as uh, Felis catus. And that's of this transition from near Asia and Africa into Europe, and then from Europe over to the United States. And you see a lot of breed development now in the United States. So again, to reiterate, the Libica breed is really the, the, the mostly the sole source of, of the uh, germplasm for creating the modern domestic cats that we know today. Now, the problem is there's still admixture. There's still components of all of these subspecies still segregating in modern domestic cats. So it's a mixed picture. Also, on the periphery of some of these areas where you have wild cats, you still have these cats breeding with domestics. So it kind of clouds the story when we're looking at this from a genetic perspective and trying to understand the signals associated with domestication. This is why it's so clean in terms of the dog-wolf transition versus the wild cat-domestic cat transition. 
So this is what uh, has really stymied our research in some ways, uh, looking at expression. So if we take those genetic markers and this multiply uh, by about 60,000, at that time they had a couple of hundred of these markers and then we developed uh, a bigger, broader set of sequence markers. And this, this represents what we call a sequence nucleotide polymorphism set, MIP. And these are 60,000 of these. And when we apply it to over 2,000 cast samples across the world, what happens is this beautiful colored plot here, it's called a structure plot, it really tries to break down the amount of SNPs that are associated with each one of these categories. And so when you, when you structure this information, this genetic information, right now we believe there's about 12 races of cats. Now, depending on how you do the analysis, you can shift the numbers around a little bit, but in essence, this gives us a, a rough number of, of the numbers of races of different cats. These studies have been done in humans and other species as well, and the bottom line is you're just trying to understand the overall ethnic origins of these different um, races. So fast forward now to breeds. So we've kind of looked at how the subspecies created the, dom the domesticated cat, the, the capis. And then when you think about breeds, breeds is really intense selection pressure on a cross that you've developed or a mutation that happens in, in a wild cat. So today we have roughly around 40 breeds of cats. And you can see we have differences in size, we have differences in coat color and patterning. But overall, the body morphology of the cat is very similar across all the different fancy breeds. That is not true in dogs. Also in dogs, uh, there's over 400 breeds, and again, depending on which uh, kennel society you talk to, there's more than that. And here you can see, of course, the very extremes of selection in the dog. So remember, dogs have been under domestication for 30,000 years ver versus about 10,000, 9,000 or so for cats. So a longer period of intense selection. That plays out for a lot of different questions that we may ask, not only for looking at uh, issues around health for the dog versus the cat, uh, but there's a lot of interesting things that using genetics we can kind of dig down to look at this question of the different breeds. So how are breeds generated? Uh, so over here on your far right you have uh, just a kind of a collection of the different breeds. You can see all the, again, the color differences mostly, but, but the size are very similar. And if we back up to this question of how do we get to the breeds, so remember we had the wild cats and we had the Libica generating the, the in terms of domestication events. But what happens is, as these breeds, uh, as breeders are basically looking at cats that are coming out of these litters, they notice interesting features associated with these cats, like pigmentation pattern differences. Or in the case of the Berman, they notice this white gloving pattern on the feet. So in the Berman, we wanted to understand whether this was associated with a mutation that would create this, this cat pattern of this white gloving pattern on the feet. We knew the kit gene was involved in pigmentation. Uh, there's lots of studies in other species, mouse, et cetera, that's looked at this gene. We know it's critical for the melanin process and, and pigmentation. When we looked at this gene in this particular study and compared it to the wildcats, we found a, a perfect deletion at this particular uh, protein coding gene. And then when we profiled this in all of the known Burmans, it's fixed. Meaning a breeder saw this mutation, they started breeding it into the population and eventually it became fixed. So artificial selection. This is really how a lot of the breeds are generated over here on the right. Is this breeders noticing interesting changes in a litter of kittens and then selecting intensively on that. That's how it works. Or you can take and cross individuals and then you create crosses and create new breeds as well. So this is really kind of the, the, the essence of trying to create a new breed. Now I'm going to switch gears and kind of bring you back to the question of the cat's relationship as a carnivore. And I wanted to capture this uh, in this slide here just to kind of show you the difference between the theliforms and the caniforms. So this would be, of course, the dog, the cat side. And uh, I always like to ask this too, does anybody know what this uh, particular species is here or the common name of it? No? It's, it's a kind of a strange, it's very rare, it's African civet. Um, so the point of all of this is to show you that this is kind of segueing us now into the next part of the talk where we want to understand how cats are different uh, within the carnivore lineage. 
And we also have to remember that cats are obligate carnivores, and that really means to devour flesh. So you may not think of your little kitty as, as a devouring flesh-eating uh, monster, but that's really how they arose. Wild cats are very, very good hunters. So this is cinnamon. This is our reference cat that we've worked with for many years. This is Abyssinian breed. And this is a nice cat that plays around with you. It has its origins, of course, in the carnivore lineage. So we have to kind of remember that as we're going through this process. And now I wanted to uh, hopefully show you a little video. And the goal of this video really is to, to educate you a little bit on the hunting behavior. Uh, again, remember we're trying to, in this discussion, in this talk we're having today, we're trying to understand the question of domestication versus hunting behavior. And I didn't want to put the video on this, but the, the front part of the talk is kind of kind of comparatively get you thinking about the domesticated cat in the household versus what happened in the wild. And most important for me is I want you to really uh, grab on to the, the second part of this video that's coming about hunting behavior of cats. And think of this, of all the wildlife documentaries you've seen, looking at lions and things like that, uh, and, and compare that to what we see here in the moment in the cat. And this is most commonly what we see, of course, cats walking around the yard. But what you may not sense in some of this is their very acute sense of hearing and, and eyesight and vision. Uh, so that they're, they're really, really incredibly uh, successful hunters. And so you'll see that in a moment here as we've moved through this. So here's the start of it. You notice the similarities of how they were big cats and what they're doing here? The, the low profile, you notice how they keep their heads completely still when they're stalking? This is the same profiles you see in lions and jaguars and so forth. Same types of kill and how they kill, and then here we come back to the nice kitty playing around. But they, they learn a lot of these skills really playing around and learning from their parents. So the whole point of that video is to show you that they still have very good hunting skills and they have a very good wild side to them, as you can see here as they're bringing back some dinner. All right. So... That is kind of the setup to start asking the questions about how artificial selection may have been changing the genome architecture of the wild versus, let's say, the domestic cat. We're still on this question of domestication. So the two questions we wanted to ask in our study that we published in, on TNAS is, first, how is the cat genome different than the other mammals? So you just recall I went over the carnivore question and how cats are part of the carnivore lineage. So we want to kind of compare and contrast cats to not only other carnivores, but also to other mammals. So we'll get into that in a moment. And then the second part of this study, we want to really look at how the genome has changed as a result of selection, artificial selection. So for the first part, uh, we really wanted to, here's a phylogenetic tree over here on the far right. And you'll, you'll, know, you'll uh, understand why I have it very small in a moment here. But in this study, we wanted to compare to human, cattle, you know, the ruminants, dog, of course, and then the tiger and the cat, so the big cat and, the, of course, the domesticated cat. So those are our species that we're going to compare here. And when we want to understand how selection is working, many times we start on the protein coding gene. So all of us in this room have roughly 20,000, 23,000 protein coding genes. We're all mammals. Cats are mammals. So we all have a similar number of protein coding genes. Protein coding genes are really the business of the body. I mean, if they're not working properly, that's when you get disease or cancer. So we start with these sets of genes and try to understand how natural or artificial selection may have been changing these in the cat. And this is our comparison, our tree, as it were. So what we do is we align these proteins to each other. And then we ask the question, do we see any differences at the amino acid level which makes up the protein? I mean, that's the composition of a protein is a string of amino acids. So in this case, just for highlight purposes here, you can see we have an amino acid difference only in the feline lineage, but not in the other carnivore here in the dog or in the ruminants or in uh, primates, humans. So this tells us that something's going on here. And what we do here, we, we build statistical models to make sure this is not happening by chance and not by drift 
And once we're confident in that, then we can say, this amino acid, for some reason, there was selection pressure to keep that in the, in the path of the feline lineage and not in other mammals. So that's kind of the basic of it. Also, uh, we can differentiate some of the changes in, be, in, uh, in the cat lineage itself. So for example, here you might have a D versus an E amino acid. So we would say, in that case, the domestication may have driven this, but we're not sure, because we have to test this in many different domestic cats. So what do we do with that information? So we have all this 20,000 so plus genes, right? We've compared them. We've looked at those signals that I just described with those amino acid differences. And we try to understand which genes are changing. So one of the things we knew were different between cats and other mammals is this acute sensory system that the cats, the carnivores have in general. So in here, you have, you remember the tree? We've broken the tree out here where we're only looking at the carnivore lineage versus other mammals. And when you look at that, the boxes here kind of show the different branches of the tree and which uh, changes that we're seeing in these proteins. And what I've highlighted here is all the sensory systems that we see these protein amino acid changes happen. So what does this mean? Basically, what it's telling us is that for hearing, we see specific amino acid changes occurring for hearing when we compare it to other mammals in the carnivore lineage. OK, that makes sense, right? Because dogs and cats have good sense of hearing. In fact, the cat among the carnivores is the best. It has over six ranges of, of hearing. So very, very uh, outstanding uh, sense of hearing in their environment. Vision is another one. So vision, in this case, we see either at the domestic cat level or we see overall in carnivores in each one of these buckets. No matter which part of the tree you're looking at and comparing, we see vision genes that are under selection pressure. Meaning, again, we're seeing those protein amino acid changes happen. So this tells us that for some reason, nature really selected pressure on this particular part of the protein to give them an advantage uh, physiologically for looking at either vision or hearing. But the most fascinating piece of this story, in my opinion, is when we start thinking about the sense of smell. So the sense of smell is really broken down into two different um, sensory systems. And anatomically, I kind of wanted to pull that up for you, give you an idea of what that looks like. So you have the olfactory receptors, of which there's hundreds of these genes. So you have all these olfactory receptors that process odorants from the environment, allow you to detect smell. Also, you have the vomal nasal organ system. This is more fine-tuned for detecting uh, differences in smell associated with estrus, so breeding behavior, reproduction. So when we started looking at this question in the cat and compared within the carnivore lineage, this is where I think the fascinating result um, showed up for this uh, comparison. So I'll walk you through this, but first uh, let me start with the vomal, nas vomal nasal organ receptor system. The green part of the pie chart here are intact genes. This means the gene is still functional. The yellow part means that the pseudogene means it's been, uh, it's defective, it means it doesn't work anymore, it's a pseudo gene. So you can see, when you look at the number, and we'll focus just on the intact numbers here, in the cat we have 21, in the tiger 20, in the dog only eight. So remember that number here in a moment when we ask this question of why this is biologically relevant. Now, if we come down here to the olfactory receptors, remember there's hundreds of these. So this collection helps us differentiate all the different odorants that they're detecting in the environment. Now, in this case, if you, again, look at the pie chart and look at the blue genes for here, this is the number of genes that are intact that are still functional. In the cat, 667 of these receptors the are in the uh, tiger 713 and in the dog 805. So to recap, for the vulmonase organ receptors, it's more in tune with detecting estrus and other females, so males versus females. You see a higher number of the vulmonase organ receptors in the feline lineage versus the dog. And in the dog, it's the opposite for the olfactory receptors. So does that make sense? Well, what do we know about the social behavior of the canids versus the feline? Anybody want to guess? So you can see, obviously, this, this is the African painted dog of a project I have, actually, with the St. Louis Zoo. But in general, canids all, well, not in general, they all have this pack 
uh, social structure. So they're constantly interacting with each other. They don't have to have this real acute sense of detecting estrus of a female that may be in the environment. Unlike the cat, very solitary. Solitary in their behavior, right? So if a female was in heat, a male would have to be really attuned in detecting that from urine if they're detecting the environment. So they would need very uh, good, diverse vulmonasal organ receptors to accomplish that task. Whereas in a social environment, you're constantly smelling the other dogs that are in that environment. That's not as crucial. Now contrast that to the olfactory receptors. We know that the, the, the dogs are no, well known for their smell. We as humans have been selecting on that, and so that really shows up in the olfactory receptor. So the sense of smell for the olfactory receptor repertoire is shifted towards the dog. So in my opinion, this makes total sense. The only anomaly and mystery uh, to this story is in the cat lineage, there is one particular species or the common name of this, this animal. What would that be that has a pack social structure or a pride? Lion. Lions are the only exception. We, we just don't know why. But it's a fascinating mystery to explore maybe in the future. OK. So one other story I'll leave you with before we, we move on to the genome aspect of change for the cat um, versus the wild versus the domesticated cat. We also remember we know they're obligate carnivores. So their diet is heavy in fat, heavy in protein. If we ate the diets of cats, at least the wild cats, our arteries would clog up and we would die, most, most, maybe not all of us, but many of us. Um, when we started looking for those, you remember those protein coding genes that were looking for differences? We started looking for those differences. Also what showed up that I didn't show you in that big phylogenetic tree of all the chemosensory systems was genes that are in the lipid metabolism pathway. So this is like, well, cool, this really makes sense to us based on what we know about the evolution of the cat and their diet and carnivores in general. And then it, it was fortuitous at the same time, a polar bear study came out. Uh, of course, polar bears eat very heavy fat diets with the seals mostly um, and fish. And not the same genes, but the genes in the same pathway showed up between our cat study and the polar bear study. And other studies now have come out looking at this question. So the bottom line is there is also selection on genes that may have given the carnivores in general an advantage of digesting these diets that are heavy in protein and fat. That if we can understand some of that alteration, uh, that evolutionary alteration, perhaps that helps us with cardiovascular study. Uh, so this is again, gets us back to this comparative medicine theme. Okay, so now we're gonna transition, as I said, looking at the whole genome level and trying to understand how the wildcat transition to the domestic cat. So what are the signals that we're seeing when we look at the whole genome level? And the cat genome is about 2.5 gigabases in size. Just to give you a, a relevant reference, the human is about 3.2 gigabases in size. So interesting, the carnivores in general have a smaller genome than other mammals. And we don't know exactly why. But uh, there's some speculation as, as to why that is. So. The study started out this way. We wanted to understand uh, a collection of domestic cats. And we chose all of these cats, and I'm not going to get into the details of a phylogenetic tree, but if you take all the known breeds of cats and you develop a tree of a genetic relationship, we tried to pick cats that hit each one of those big branches of the tree, what we call the nodes of the tree. So these are the collection of cats we used, all domesticated. And then most importantly, we had to make sure our wildcat species were truly wildcats. So these uh, particular cats that we compared against were captured in the deserts near Israel uh, and also in parts of uh, very rural European areas. In this particular case, we chose uh, a pool of Libica and Sylvestris. Sylvestris, you remember from my earlier slide, is the European wildcat. And Libica is the Asian um, African cat at the tips of those migration patterns. So we pulled these sequences and these sequences, and then we compared them to each other. Now, what are we looking for? So I don't expect you to know all the details of the statistical measures we use, but I wanted to give you kind of a visual of what we're looking for when we look at these sequences at the whole genome level. Remember, we're comparing 
so many bases that we sequenced for a 2.5 gigabase cat genome of the wild cat versus the domestic cat. So what you would like to see or what your expectation is, if you had selection on a particular part of a genome, could be a megabase in size or it could be, you know, 100,000 bases in size. You're looking for these sequence differences to be somewhat fixed or a very low level of diversity in a region compared to a lot of diversity. So in this scenario here, we would say, oh, at this locus three, there's something going on here. There's some kind of selection pressure. Now, what does that mean? Once we know where that region is and can define the boundaries of that region, then we can dig into the genes that reside in those regions, and then that comes the then comes the biological inference. So all the genes we have, not all of them, but many of them, we know what their function is. So if they reside in this area, we can start to, again, infer what they might be doing and why do we see this selection pressure in this part of the cat, the domestic cat, versus the wild. And then that shows up as depressions in variation or increases in the variation when you compare them. So what do we find? All right. So again, this is a nice little color, what we call a circos plot. These color bars here are three chromosomes in the cat. On the outside here are the genes. <coughs> Excuse me. And then on the inside, you don't need to know all the details, but basically that's where we're looking for these sequence differences and trying to refine where we see this diversity in the wild versus the domesticated cat. When we do that, we get about 12 of these genes, but so what? What are these genes doing? So does this mean anything? Uh, is there any kind of relevance to these genes? Well, when we look at what those genes do, it turns out it's a fascinating um, uh, finding in terms of their, uh, their function. And I've just chosen five of these, but of those 12 genes that I showed you previously, six of them had some kind of a function associated with the neuronal process. So you remember back when I was hammering away at the behavior question and tameness and docility? Well, this to us tells us that there's definitely selection pressure in a wild cat versus a domestic cat. At least over time, that starting point that we guessed is around 9,000 years ago. We believe tameness was the, harsh, or the, uh, the strongest selection pressure in either a commensural or a self-directed direction on uh, the genome of the cat. And this is our evidence here, this heavy enrichment for genes that are involved in the neuronal process. And I've highlighted one of these genes here, and you can see here the definition plays a critical role in neural crest survival. So what I'm not going to get into today, but the domestication syndrome was recently defined by a group. These, these guys were looking at trying to understand the molecular explanation of domestication. So the neural crest, as it, as it uh, migrates during development down in a symmetrical fashion, ends up differentiating into different cell types. So you remember back when I was showing you what, we, what Darwin saw with the differences in wild versus domesticated, floppy ears, smaller brain, tameness, all these other differences? Well, the neural crest cells that differentiate can explain a lot of that difference. Now, this is a very loose theory right now in terms of consolidating all that. But right now, this is kind of our best understanding of how domesticated work at the molecular level. There was selection on these genes. And again, you can see many of these are neuronal processes. Now, this is not proof. I want to emphasize that. This is not definitive proof. This is an indirect way of us inferring that selection was definitely most on tameness or docility in the early stages of domestication. Now, today we know selection is on hair and hair pigmentation. That's the breed part of it. But the early domestication signals and pressure by the commensural relationship with humans was on tameness. So the last part of my talk, I'm going to discuss. I've given you, I think, a flavor of the genetic, genetic history of the cat. Uh, I've talked a little bit about what we found at the molecular level and at the whole genome level. And now we're transitioning in the future for us is really looking at how to use this information for what I call genomic medicine. And at the veterinarian level in the clinic, you've probably heard a lot about the precision medicine uh, in humans. And so before we get into that discussion, I think this is a very nice uh, definition of what precision medicine means. I like to think of it as genomic medicine because it's really taking genomic information and trying to apply it uh, to a patient. 
So part of my role here at MU also is working on the cancer side. So cancer is probably the most advanced of targeting fly precision medicine initiative or, or methods. But as you can see here, the goal really is to try to either take information, phenotype information from patients, many, many numbers of patients, or genetic information and predict outcome. So in cancer, we're getting closer with knowing the numbers of genes that are driving different cancer types. Now we kind of have to catch up with the therapy. But we're getting closer in understanding the, the true genetic landscape of cancer. Now in cats, if we, th if we think about cancer and common diseases, I think this is probably the best study that's tried to characterize the, the types of variation we see in terms of the disease occurrence in cats. And here on this y-axis is all the different disease categories. And then over here on the, uh, the x-axis, you see the percentage of occurrence by the different breeds of cats. So one thing that will really jump out to you, I hope, in the color scheme here is the darker numbers, of course, show in terms of a heat map, the larger numbers of disease occurrence for dental and oral diseases. So in cats, that's real, this is probably our most common thing we see in the clinic is the, is the oral diseases. So the goal here, of course, is to take all of this type of information, process it, and redirect our, our efforts on genomic medicine to try to address either predictive outcomes for these diseases or better therapies for what we have now. And again, human is leading the way. But we have to have this kind of uh, longitudinal data in order to, to move forward. So when I say human is leading the way, this is, this is a, a, a kind of a snapshot of all the different uh, sequence variation that's been cataloged for all kinds of human diseases. And what I'm showing you here is really common diseases. This doesn't even count cancer. So cancer is, in my opinion, is a totally different look at the question in the human population. But what I hope you get out of this is you can see there's thousands and thousands and thousands of variants that have been uh, associated with a disease. So how do we move that to prediction and, and genomic medicine? And in the context of cats, this is what I've uh, summarized and how we need to move that direction. Again, we're learning everything from humans, and we're kind of following in their footsteps and learning from them and what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. But the bottom line really is, as in humans, we want to treat the population in a precision manner. So we, want, we may have to have predictive markers for different breeds. Uh, but because, again, I want to point out, and I didn't point out earlier, I forgot to mention, of the roughly 80 million household cats in the United States, over probably 95% of them are what we would call random breds or admixed cats. There's very few purebreds. But of course, once we understand the signatures in purebreds, we can treat them accordingly, or we can treat this admixture population as well. So the bottom line is we need to get better information by breeds as well as the admixed population to understand how to treat these cats or predict uh, outcome in terms of disease. And that holds true for cancer as well. So to do that, we needed a, a stellar reference, what I call a genome reference. So all computational analysis that we do in terms of genetic predictions in humans or any species has to start with a high quality reference. So we built a high quality reference and you don't need to know all the details here, but this is a, a genome browser that you can enter and ask anywhere in the genome what's going on there in terms of the, the, the sequences that are located there or the protein coding genes. And here I've just highlighted uh, chromosome A1 in the cat. You can walk along here and look at any parts of the genome. The important, important uh, point of this slide is to show that you have to have a good reference as a starting point for practicing genomic medicine. The other thing you need to have is a very good understanding of the variance in the population. So as in human, if we're sequencing all these humans, we're cataloging all the differences in each individual. Once we know the frequency of changes in each individual base in a 3.2 gigabase genome of human, then we can fine tune our, our, our uh, genetic analysis in terms of the association of those changes to a disease or to cancer. We have to, we have to do the same thing in the cat. So there's very nice data sets and, and processes to curate those variants. Uh, and also in the cat, we have to be closely linked to the clinicians that are working and seeing these cats all the time and all the phenotypes that are being collected. So the whole point of this, just like in humans, the electronic health records or the health records of each individual patient, whether it's a companion animal or a human, 
we have to start cataloging all that uh, and matching it to all the sequence variation that we notice. How are we using this information? So right now, we've sequenced over 200 cats um, as part of the 99 Live project, which I'll get to in a moment. And you remember we have this good computational starting point, a genome reference for the domestic cat. And we've sequenced all these cats. So once we align all that sequence information to the reference, and we distinguish not only single base, <coughs> single sequence base changes, but larger pieces, insertions and deletion events. We catalog all that in databases, and then we start searching cats that we know have known defects, like dwarfism. So this is the Napoleon breed. And what you're seeing here is the body morphology in terms of the link in the head is, is fairly normal, but then you can see the structure of the legs are, are very compact. And then this is just an x-ray showing kind of how that looks uh, in, at the bone structure. Now, there, there are interesting. Um, similarities, but one thing you'll see in a moment is most of the mutations in the human population are on this FGF receptor, 70% or more. In fact, some of them would say 90% or more of what we're seeing in the clinics for humans is on this one gene explaining dwarfism in the human population. So when we looked at this question in the cat, uh, first we had a pedigree analysis where we know that dwarfism was segregating. So you have affected and unaffected individuals showing dwarfism or not. And then we did what we call a, an association study, uh, cats that did not have dwarf, dwarfism and cats that did. Both of these line up on one particular chromosome. And then when we looked at great detail, remember we have that database of single base changes and insertion and deletion events that are different in the population. When we looked at that, we found one interesting gene. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all the details of the structural change, but it's a very complicated change, and we still don't understand molecularly how it happened. Uh, but the bottom line is you had this piece that broke off and duplicated, and then there was a truncation event also at the end of the gene. So here's the affected individual. This piece is lopped off, and then this piece is duplicated and added onto the end of it. So if you think about it, uh, molecular speaking, uh, it's very challenging to understand the recombination mechanism that would account for that change. But this is what we, we see, and we've validated it in many cats now. Uh, so this is a structural change that we see in dwarfism cats. And at the top here, this is the name of the gene. This is, remember, this is not the FGF gene. This is not human. This is a new gene that we've not seen before in human that we think explains dwarfism. Now, we have to, of course, do more studies to to validate, but so far all of our validation is holding true that this gene we think is responsible for dwarfism, at least in the Napoleon population. So that's an application, that's a beautiful application of using genomic tools to find diseases. Once you catalog these, you catalog many, many, many of these diseases, then you put large disease panels together and then you can survey more cats. And that really gets us towards precision medicine in the clinic. So moving forward. We would like to uh, encourage you to, if you have a cat of interest or if you would like to donate, we're trying to raise funds to sequence more cats because I hope I've given you uh, a nice example of how we use that sequence information to discover new diseases and also when we find these new uh, disease genes in a cat and we don't see them in human, this helps the human side of the equation as well. So if you're interested, uh, Leslie Leons has set up um, this website here, uh, we're looking for donations, or if you want to sequence your favorite cat, we'll kind of give you the, the cost associated with that and encourage you to, to do that as well. But this is what's referred to the 99 Lives Project. It's no longer 99 cats. We've gone well beyond that, and that's a good thing, and we want to grow this database as large as we can. Because as in humans, uh, the more we sequence, the more we understand the variation, the more accurate we're going to get with practicing genomic medicine. And that's the little spin of here, which I have to show that because my son did that. That was pretty cool. <laughs> now, now I, I, will end, I will end with this slide because I love this slide. Uh, is your cat truly domesticated? So what I hope I've summarized here today is I think the question is still open as to whether the cat self-domesticated itself or humankind drove that process. 
Now, I will hedge my bets, and, and we did this in our paper in PNAS as well. We basically said we think the cat is semi-domesticated, uh, and that's because of that hunting behavior that I was showing you, and also this continual admixture, even though it's a very small percentage of truly wild cats with domestic cats that actually are commensal in, in US households. So this is, of course, a staged uh, situation. But kind of on a serious side, we, we do see, with the uh, domestication process, we're seeing a lot more diabetic cats. Uh, and we see a lot more obesity in cats, too. It's kind of what we're seeing in the human population as well at this point in time. So I think this, uh, because they, they interact with us in the household and they have these diets, this will be another interesting angle to look at the questions of, of domestication. And probably the most important slide is all the, the wonderful people that I work with uh, to bring you these stories. A particular shout out to Leslie Leone here uh, at the uh, University of Missouri at the vet school. Uh, she's really taught me everything that I know about cats and continue to learn from her about cat genetics. And um, I think I will stop there and take any questions. Be happy to answer any of your questions. All righty, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll bring you a microphone. Um, great talk. Um, does the, um, do the um, genes that you propose to be associated with domestication uh, translate to other domesticated species? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so there's been these uh, what I'll call meta-analysis studies to try to understand if some of those same genes that we're seeing in our domestication studies are seen in these cases like the fox is a great example, the Russian experiments where they've domesticated foxes. Uh, there's rat lines where they've looked at aggression and docility. There's studies in the pigs and so forth. Uh, the one gene I would say that seems to carry across all studies is the glutamate receptor. Uh, and, and the glutamate receptor is a very well-known neurotransmitter system for that's associated with reward behavior and things of that nature. Now, I will say there's, there's unique genes, of course, in each one of those studies. And when you start to break it down by the uh, association of these genes to different canonical gene pathways, that's where you see, see more enrichment across all the studies. So as an example, uh, like I was saying with the lipid metabolism, you may have like 20 genes associated with a pathway. And one of those genes you find in your study, and in the other study they find a different gene, but they both belong to the same pathway. So what evolution is doing is basically picking and choosing based on the, uh, the history of that particular species of which gene it's altering, but the outcome really is to change the pathway and the, the outcome of that pathway in terms of the signaling in, in, a, in a physiological type of manner. I was interested because I went to Malaysia once and I noticed those very short-tailed cats, and I think Darwin also noticed them. Yes. And I was wondering if you'd done any work with them, and you know, are they like the... Uh, Manx cats as well. Do they have so the same? I have not. Uh, Leslie has worked with the Japanese bobtail is yeah, one example. It's the same. Uh, and I, ha I didn't have, well, I have a slide, but I didn't show it today. But it's kind of a, it's not a truncation, but the actual bone structure in the tail curls back on itself. So you get that little bobtail uh, in the Japanese bobtail. That gene is known in terms of how that process plays out at a molecular level. Um, but I, I don't know about the Manx and, and that system that you're describing. This is slightly off topic, but um, uh, lab mice. Um, my father was a vet professor here, and he was always bringing them home for us kids as pets. And they're very intelligent, and they're very affectionate. And of course, they're all selectively very similar. And they've only been bred as lab mice for, what, about 100 years. How domesticated are lab mice? Yeah, so there are studies. Uh, there's many studies that looking at the question of wild versus domesticated mice. Uh, to be honest, I don't know all the molecular outcomes of those studies, uh, but there is some common features that we see across domestication studies. And in the mice, of course, because we can control all the matings and look at all the crosses, and we have congenic strains and things of that nature to know exactly where things are happening. Um, and there are, there are of these molecular pathways that you mentioned are under study and trying to knock them out. But because in the mouse, because it's our, one of our standard models for vertebrates, 
they're knocking out almost every gene in the mouse. They're, they're, get, they're approaching the point where they've knocked out at least all the genes that are not lethal uh, across the whole mouse genome. And they, they're measuring phenotypes, including behavior. So you can really go into the database if you ask questions about the mouse, a particular gene that you might see in, let's say, a fox study, and look at what's going on in the mouse. And you can get an answer in terms of the behavioral phenotype. So that's, that's a beautiful example of how we use the mouse model for that purpose. I don't know if it answers your question, but there, if you breed for docility and aggression in rats and mice, you can clearly see it, and it does differentiate fairly quickly. The fox experiment is probably the most famous of domestication, and that took about, I'd say, about three decades before you saw a very clear difference where you could actually pet the fox, and just like a cat or a dog, and then, of course, the wild, you would you'd go near the cage, and they would try to bite you. Uh, so it was very clear fascinating difference, but that's about three decades. Um, okay, um, one of my questions is, uh, what was, oh yeah, this was, this might be a little bit obvious, but um, back in the, you know, where you show, you know, the caniforms and the filiforms, I noticed that you put a hyena in the filiform, so that means that just because, you know, a dog can also technically be a filiform, right? Okay, just all, just all I want to know because I was confused about why there was a hyena there. Yeah, I mean, it seems odd, right? But that's, that's their genetic relationships, yeah. So, Whether he was one of those three. Yeah, so your, is your, your question is, if we sequence our cat and put that information in the database, what would we get back out of that? I guess kind of, but yeah. I find out anything about it. So as we're, what we're doing with these 99 lives that are greater than 200 now, as we catalog the variation, um, the, the first paper that's going to come out on this is a subset of that 99 lives that, that I'm working on right now. So that will be a publication of all the variation we see in, in great detail. But as we get more cats, we're going to kind of expand that relationship. And in the next iteration of this, this paper that we'll publish soon, uh, where we'll have all 200, we'll have the wild coolidge in there as well. So that kind of fits, I think, better with your question of this cat that came from the Caucasus. You would get a uh, genetic relationship, at least, and you would know the, the deleterious variants that are segregating in that. This is what we're most interested in. When we compare all these sequences across cats, and then we align them against databases of humans where we know there's pathogenic variants, and then we can see whether that variant is shared in the cat. And in many cases, it's not, but the cat has a different one. So within the same gene, you have a different amino acid that's affected. And that's really the comparative side of the fascinating part about it is in a human, it may be uh, pathogenic. And in a cat, even though it's on the same gene, may be benign and not causal. And that's, that's the real power of this approach, the comparative approach. So adding to that, well, I think the bottom line is what you would get out of it is a genetic relationship to the other breeds as well as wilds. Uh, if you were able to donate to a cat, uh, you would also get kind of a, a listing of the deleterious variants and somewhat of a prediction of what they do. This is kind of the wild west right now for uh, humans as well is trying to establish all these different, I mean, there's millions of these that we're looking at in humans, whether they're uh, benign or causal. Uh, and so you'll see papers come out in, in high impact journals kind of kind of try to figure this out. Uh, this is where we are in human right now. Is the reason that uh, domestication results in smaller brains, is that because humans supply some of the needs and we want to eat, and so we don't need so much smart to yeah. survive? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and I have not seen any uh, detailed studies to try to explain uh, from a developmental biology s standpoint or context for that question, how the genes that may have been selected on that would change brain size. But like you said, simplistically thinking about it, 
uh, if they didn't have to have as much uh, energy devoted to maintaining molecular systems that keep them alive in the wild, keep them fit, and they can just basically come up in the morning and eat their food that the humans give them. It's a much simpler life in terms of uh, sophistication and, and the chemosensory system and all those things that they need to survive in the wild. And also they're not exposed to a lot of the pathogens that they are in the wild. So, but that doesn't fit your brain and, uh, question, but overall I think that's kind of the simplistic reason why you're seeing the differences in brain structure. Um, but I don't have a, a molecular explanation for that. First, first of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, two quick questions, I'll just ask them together if I could. Okay. So you talked about um, pre, uh, kind of three points of domestication, the prey, the, the direct, and, and the commensalism. Right. Um, are those steps in some cases, or do those happen sort of, I mean, in other words, once an animal is attracted to the human settlement, and then we start to see the um, benefit to us, and then eventually we become attracted or enough to them to bring them inside. Is that, is those, are those sometimes steps? And then the last one was, you talked about the kind of interbreeding around the edges between domestic and wild cat populations. In the bigger picture, picture in terms of, uh, I don't know, um, genetic strength or something, is that a good thing to happen, to continue to bring in those outside sources to domestics or? Yeah, so, so your first question, uh, remind me your first question again was? Yeah, the prey, sorry. Yes, so the prey, commensural and directed. So that, that's kind of the, uh, there's three methods that have been proposed in the literature to explain uh, domestication. My belief is that uh, prey was really the first component of domestication. So when grains were stored during the agricultural revolution and a lot of rodents started to show up because free food, right? Lots of food in one location. It makes natural sense that cats were, that were in that territory see that as easy prey and not as much work to get the prey that they need to sustain life. So that was the start. The humans noticed this benefit to this uh, cat coming in and eating the rodents that were eating their grains. And then you started to see either directed or commensal type of pressure on the cats to stay around. Now, I think it's kind of a gradient process. So prey started the process, and then you had commensal directed. So the question of whether it's self-directed and the cats just see that benefit and didn't want anything to do with humans is, is a different question, I think. And the commensal side of it, I think, really started later, probably more towards the Egyptian era in the 4,000 um, truly commensal relationships. But it's hard to know. It's hard to predict. We do know, based on the fossil evidence, when they bury human bones with cat bones, the assumption is there was a commensal relationship at that point. If we make that assumption, then we can go all the way back to 9,000 years with either Cyprus or these Chinese people. I mean, it makes sense from a predator species, cats, dogs, but what about the herbivorous ones? I mean, did you have wild pigs that came in and that's what, you're, I mean, does it apply into those kind of species that were domesticated no. also? Oh, so I, I would say the prey uh, domestication is, is unique to the canids and the felines. Um, yeah, I can't think of any other species where that would be the initiation point for the, uh, the domestication process. So your second question was? Had to do with the, the benefits of yeah, yeah, the benefits of admixture, right? So is it a good thing that cats uh, are still interbreeding with domestic cats? Uh, on the peripheries of these wild versus uh, domestic boundaries, let's say. I think it's a good thing. <coughs> Anything that promotes admixture <coughs> is a good thing, in my opinion. And there's plenty of studies showing that if you increase inbreeding, this is a bad thing. Great example of that is with dogs. So uh, if you look at cancer in dogs and cats, dogs past the age of 10 years, roughly 50% of them show some type of cancer. Cats, very little. Um, now, is that directly related to the timing of domestication? Probably not. Is it related to selection intensity in dogs versus cats? I think so. Um, because anytime you increase the number of bottlenecks that you have in a population, we know from the human side of this, like in the Iceland and Finnish population, the, the number of deleterious alleles rise in frequency in these populations. Um, so it's very clear genetics, and they've proven this in mouse and other studies and models. So I think <coughs> that it is a benefit. Uh, in terms of me looking at these signals of domestication and trying to understand when they happened and how much of it happened, it's a really hard thing to get past 
because you have kind of the admixture. And then you, want, you really want clean signals for looking at domestication, a clean break like you have in the dog and the wolf. Um, but even in that scenario, you, you have to also think about drift. Is this natural mutation that occurs uh, one generation after another? And trying to tease apart true selection from drift is also a very challenging thing to get at. <coughs> All righty, let's have another round of applause for our speaker.